I came across a really interesting concept recently. It allows us to extend volumes of revolution in calculus to any dimension. The first short section of this video will be used to find the volume of a sphere, which will hopefully help us to understand how the extension into four dimensions works. To find the volume of a sphere, we first need a function or relation that represents the radii of the cross section of that sphere. For this, we will use the circle relation x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Rearranging, we get the following. Note that we ignore the negative part of the function as we only need the positive part. The graph of the function is a circle with radius, r. Recall that the integral of any function bounded from a to b represents the sum of all the infinitesimal rectangles that add up to the area under the curve from a to b. We can now apply the concept of volumes of rotation. For any length, r, we can square it and multiply by pi to get the area of a circle with radius r. We can apply that same concept to a function. If we let the function represent the radius, then squaring and multiplying by pi gives us the area of a circle with a radius of the function. Now let us apply that to the semicircle function. Let f of x be equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared. If we apply the rotation, we get the following function where each value returned by the function will now represent the area of a circle with a radius f of x. If we multiply the area of the circle by some value, say dx, we get the volume of a cylinder. The sum of all these infinitesimal cylinders that make up the sphere, or the integral of our rotated function should be exactly equal to the volume of a sphere. We can set up this integral and solve it quite easily. This results in the equation for the volume of a sphere with radius r. Now comes the really interesting part. Previously, we rotated the function into circles and multiplied by dx to make cylinders. Now instead of rotating the function into circles, we can rotate it into spheres. We can then multiply the sphere by dx to obtain four-dimensional cylinders called spherinders. It is a four-dimensional prism with spheres instead of circles as faces. At this point, we go beyond the realm of human imagination as we only experience the world in three dimensions. Try to keep up by comparing these steps to the previous example. Now for the function f of x. To rotate it into a sphere, we cube it and multiply by 4 thirds pi. To make the spherinders, we multiply by dx. By integrating from negative r to r, we should obtain the volume of a four-dimensional sphere. The following integral is very challenging but is solvable through trigonometric substitution and reduction. We start off with our integral from negative r to r. We can ignore the bounds for now and factor out the constant 4 thirds pi. We can also simplify the exponent to 3 halves. I will circle the constant in blue that we will ignore for now and come back to later. The green box is what we are going to solve. We can apply a neat trigonometric substitution that is going to dramatically simplify the integral. We can let x be equal to our sine of u, therefore u is equal to arc sine of x over r and dx is equal to our cosine u du. Substituting x and dx, we get the following. r squared minus r squared times sine squared of u can be simplified to r squared cosine squared of u. Simplifying the powers gives us the integral of r to the fourth times cosine to the fourth of u. Again, r is a constant and can therefore be factored out from the integral. We will only deal with the integrand for now. Now that everything is in terms of cosine, we can apply the reduction formula to reduce the powers of the integrand. The following formula can be applied. Since our n is equal to 4, we can apply the reduction once more for n equals 2. The integral of 1 du is of course u, putting everything back together, and we have solved the integral of cosine to the fourth of u. We can now reintroduce the constant r to the fourth from before. Now we can undo the u substitution. We know that u was equal to arc sine of x over r. Note that the cosine of arc sine has its own identity. Thus, by resubstituting we obtain the following equation. We can't forget about the 4 thirds pi constant that needs to be multiplied back in, and we can bound the solved integral from negative r to r. We realize that in our substitution that is negative or positive will result in zero for the first and second term, and so they can be ignored. For the last term, the substitution of positive r into arc sine of x over r results in arc sine of 1, which is equal to pi over 2. For the negative r, 
we obtain negative pi over 2 for the arcsine of negative r over r, but because the lower bound is subtracted from the upper bound, the negatives cancel out. This leaves us with pi squared over 2 times r to the fourth. This is the four-dimensional volume of a four-dimensional sphere. The first time I solved this integral it was absolutely mind-boggling how math can go so far beyond our imagination. This concept can be applied to any number of dimensions. For example, given the new equation that we just calculated, we could apply it to rotate our semicircle function into four-dimensional spheres, multiply by dx to get five-dimensional cylinders and integrate to obtain the volume of a five-dimensional sphere. The following is a table that illustrates the n-dimensional volumes of n-dimensional spheres for the next few dimensions. There is one very interesting and odd observation to be made. Every two dimensions, the volume seems to be multiplied by pi. We know that from our integral, this comes from the arcsine of 1, but in what way does this intuitively make sense? If you know the answer to this, have anything to contribute and correct me on, or have a question about the concepts in this video, leave it in the comments. Thank you for sticking to the end and leave a like if you enjoyed.